if I could, just a, a raise of hands, how many people here have some involvement with the purchasing of insurance for your companies? Okay. Um, and, and how many people here have commercial tenants as well as residential tenants? Okay, just so I have an idea as to the, the audience in terms of my presentation. Um, please, if you have any questions, ask the questions during the presentation. I think that makes for a lively uh, presentation. And it also keep John from interrupting too much, which he's going to do. So uh, first of all, insurance coverage. I always like to start my presentations with what I call Insurance 101. We buy insurance to transfer risk. That is what insurance is for. So what I tell clients is, if something bad happens to your organization, look to insurance. Something bad happening to, an to a, a company is either you get what's called a first party claim, which is you have property damage or a loss of income because of something that happens, or what's called a third party claim, which is what the two Johns have largely talked about, which is, or you're being sued by someone. They're the two types of, of claims that, that you could have come in uh, and that's the type of loss that your organization could have, and the first place that you should look is insurance. I always tell clients that notice is not like wine. It does not get better with time. <laughs> if you have circumstances that could give rise to a claim, that phrase is something that's often in insurance policies, you should put every conceivable insurance company on notice. Uh, the reason for that are twofold. There are two types of insurance policies, and I'll talk about them in a minute, occurrence-based policies and claims-made claims policies. For occurrence-based policies, generally, if you don't provide timely notice, you can still get coverage as long as the insurance company isn't prejudiced by the delay. By that, I mean you get a tenant that sues you. You do nothing on it. The lawsuit goes in a drawer somewhere. There's a default judgment. You wake up after there's a $50,000 verdict against you or a $5 million verdict against you. You send it to the, your insurance company. The insurance company is going to say, you've got to be kidding. Uh, you know, we're, we're prejudiced by you not giving us this suit. Uh, it's very hard for an insurance company to prove prejudice ab absent that type of circumstance. The bigger issue, though, is that you will not be able to get your defense paid for until you give your insurance company notice. So the longer you wait, the tougher it's going to be for you to ask the insurance company to pay the attorney's fees that you've incurred to date. And as both Johns had mentioned, particularly in the, the, what we're talking about with bed bug litigation and mold litigation and, and with lead paint litigation, uh, the defense costs can greatly exceed the actual claim amount. So you want to be careful that you are not doing anything to jeopardize your coverage and, and so that you can get the insurance company paying the defense as quickly as possible. The other side of it is claims made coverage, and we're going to talk about that in the context of um, some of the policies that are out there. The difference between a, an occurrence policy and a claims made policy is an occurrence policy covers claims that occur during the, the policy period. So you have a tenant, uh, and the tenant's been in a property for 10 years, and there's an allegation of lead-based paint exposure, and they allege that they've been exposed to that lead-based pa lead paint for 10 years, you are going to be able to tap each of the 10 years of policies uh, for as long as that claim occurred, because it was occurring over the entire time period. Conversely, a claims-made policy provides coverage for when the claim actually comes in. So you get the lawsuit on the lead-based paint this year, under a claims made policy, you would tender it to this year's policy. So a big difference in terms of what you have. Key though is make sure you provide notice because in many jurisdictions for a claims made policy, if you don't provide notice, you forfeit coverage. Meaning the insurance company may have no defense at all under the policy, but if you are a day late, you forfeit coverage. There is a law firm in Philadelphia that had a $10 million verdict against it that it could not collect under its insurance because it did not provide timely notice. So the key is if you have a claim and you think it could result in, in, in a personal injury or property damage claim, uh, make sure that notice goes out to your insurance company. Uh, control the information. John mentioned this towards the end of his, of, of his presentation. If you have a claim and you know you're going to be getting your insurance company involved, please, 
please control the information that goes to the insurance company. What do I mean by that? You have a situation where you have mold, you contact the insurance company, the insurance company says, I want to send my expert out to adjust your loss. That expert is not to adjust your loss. That expert is to find reasons for the insurance company to deny coverage. Understand that, that they are working against you when they're investigating the claim. So be very careful about what information goes to that expert. I like to use hypotheticals because they tend to scare the audience when I use them, but I had a case several years ago. It was a uh, commercial case. There was a rupture of a pipe in a large production facility. The production facility was down for about a week because of it. Uh, it resulted in about $10 million of lost sales, a uh, pretty significant claim. For whatever reason, when the insurance company representative came out to inspect the work site, they had their union maintenance guy take him on the tour. No one else, the union maintenance guy took him on the tour. Union maintenance guy takes him to where the loss occurs and he said, you know, I keep telling them, you gotta replace the gaskets in here because they get clogged and we haven't replaced it in a long time. And, you know, that's what caused this because the gasket blew in it. Well, you know what? The gasket didn't blow. There was a problem upstream from that. We spent two years and literally $250,000 arguing about that one issue, which could have been avoided if you simply controlled the information and said you could do whatever you want, you could look at everything you want, but don't have anybody characterize the cause of the loss, the result of the loss, until you are absolutely sure about what it is. Uh, using words like flood, John mentioned it. A lot of uh, implications from Superstorm Sandy. Notice I say Superstorm Sandy and not Hurricane Sandy, because you will never hear anybody that knows insurance coverage call it a hurricane. The reason for that is there is a hurricane deductible that is higher than a Superstorm deductible. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm giving you that example because words are important in insurance policies. And, you know, John's example, you don't want to have in your, in your forms or in your report that there was a flood in an apartment if it was a leak. Because floods can be excluded, but leaks aren't. So, again, control the information. Duty to defend. I mentioned earlier that the key in getting insurance coverage for these types of cases, or the big benefit, is getting the case defended and paid for by the insurance company. Your insurance company has an obligation to defend you when the circumstances of the claim against you can reasonably fall within coverage. That's critical because often what you will get in a lawsuit is you will have five different claims against you, negligence, intentional torts, breach of contract. If any of one of those claims falls within coverage, you are entitled to a defense for the entire action. And again, you know, you could end up spending $200,000 defending a case and at the end of the day settle it for a nuisance value of five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. You want to make sure that the $250,000 is covered in your defense costs. So make sure you're aware that insurance company's obligation to defend is very broad and you want to be insistent on it. So let's talk about some of the specifics with what we're talking about today. Uh, anybody that does insurance coverage from the policyholder side, you become an insurance uh, historian. And the reason for that is insurance companies, like all entities, when they, are, when they have a new product, often go out and explain the virtues of that product. So when they are explaining the virtues of that product, they often embellish, or they will give the broadest interpretation of that, that coverage in order to sell it to you. Well, what happens when a claim comes in? They take the narrowest interpretation of that. So what we always do is we go back and we see what was the insurance company representing to the insurance departments, what's in their sales literature, what were they saying at the time of sale versus what are they saying right now. Insurance coverage for mold. If you go back and look at your policies that are seven, eight, nine years or older, you will not see a mold exclusion. Did we not have mold 10 years ago? Of course we did. But as it became a, a bigger issue in terms of litigation and costs, insurance companies started to take the position first that mold was not included in your policy. There wasn't an exclusion in it. It wasn't included because it was a pollutant. They started to lose that argument. They started to spend a lot of money on that argument. So they then started putting in mold exclusions. 
so they first sell a policy, same premium, provides coverage for mold. Then they exclude the, the mold. And then what do they do? They sell back to you an endorsement for mold. And all of you who are involved in purchasing insurance, you're probably working with a broker that is aware that there are endorsements specifically to cover mold. And you know some of these endorsements have pretty, pretty big deductibles. So they're not meant to go in and, and you know, resolve the, the, the small spot of mold on the ceiling because there was a leak. We're talking about you know, significant mold claims and the ability to recover not only the cost of remediating your property, but also any third party claims. So if you're working with a good broker, they're going to be able to explain to you at least the options in terms of what type of exclusions, I'm sorry, endorsements are out there to specifically provide you with coverage for, for mold claims. Uh, this is just an example of the, uh, the types of exclusions that are now found in insurance policies for mold. Uh, and you can see the first exclusion was one sentence. Now it's a paragraph in some, and I, I didn't have time to put it in, but there are certain insurance companies now that have an entire page of a mold exclusion. Uh, so you know they, they keep trying to knock more and more of it out. Again, the best way to deal with mold, if, it, if you are in a situation where you think that's something where you might be exposed to, is transfer the risk by making sure that you have insurance coverage for it. Uh, in terms of insurance coverage for mold, even though mold might be excluded, one of the things you have to look at are what, what's the, what is the damage that results from the mold. Is it simply, simply the, remediating of, the remediating of the mold, or is it something where there's further damage either in a, product, in a personal injury case uh, or something more? And what you never want to hear is you and I having a conversation on proximate causation for mold. Because that's the legal test in a lot of jurisdictions. Did the mold cause the damage that resulted? Is it a, a consequence flowing from it when looking at the policy? And I'll give you a couple of examples of how, how cases have come out. In this case, which is from North Carolina, uh, water and mold damaged a home under construction because of vandalism. <clears throat> Excuse me. Vandalism is a covered pearl under the policy, meaning that vandalism claims are typically covered under the policy. There was, however, a mold exclusion. And in this case, uh, the, the uh, esteemed judge ruled that there was no coverage for the resulting damage from the mold uh, because it, the, the damage flowed from mold, not from the vandalism itself. As a policyholder attorney, I don't agree with that, but that is how some jurisdictions come out. Uh, compare that to uh, an interesting case from Washington where there was a tenant who had a, uh, a, a crop of marijuana being grown in their apartment. And uh, um, don't ask me how I know this, but I know that when you're growing marijuana, you need a hot and wet environment. Uh, and what, el what else grows in a hot and wet environment? Mold. Uh, in this case, that court looking at almost exactly language, exactly the same language came out in the opposite direction and said, you know, look, this is not, the mold was not, uh, the proximate cause was the tenant's actions, and so we're going to provide coverage for the, the mold re remediation case. Again, you don't want to have a conversation with me about proximate causation. You want to deal with this issue when you're buying your policy, and you want to talk to brokers who have experience in this so that they can make sure that you have the right coverage out there. A uh, couple of things to do in terms of, of what to do. Obviously, it, for those of you who are involved in insurance, uh, purchasing the insurance, read your policy. You will be surprised how many people don't read insurance policies, including myself. Uh, I don't think I've ever read my homeowner's insurance or ever read my auto insurance. Uh, you know, it, it, you, you do what most people do, the premium. You, you t your broker contacts you at renewal time. You ask what the premium is. You ask what the deductible is. And you ask what the limits are. Uh, and they say, and you, you reach an agreement, how much you have to pay, you send them a check, and a month later, two months later, six months later, you get a policy in the mail, and it goes in a drawer. That is the same thing that happens for most businesses. Uh, it's the same thing. I've had policies that were issued six months, eight months, nine months after the policy went into effect. Uh, but I still, for things like this, you need to be familiar with your policy, 
or hire people that are familiar with your policy to see whether you have a mold endorsement for coverage. Talk with your broker, as I mentioned, uh, provide notice, and don't take no for an answer. At the conclusion of this, I'll give you kind of my top 10 tips in terms of how to get insurance coverage, and I'll talk about what you need to do uh, to properly motivate your insurance company. Uh, as I mentioned, the coverage that, uh, there, that's out there for uh, mold coverage is written by endorsement, and that's often on a claims-made basis, meaning it's going to cover any claim that comes in during the policy year. You have to be aware of that, and you have to, within your organization, make sure that there is the, pro the proper reporting up of the chain of command in order to make sure that that claim is reported to the insurance company. Whether it's lead-based paint or mold or bed bugs, you have to make sure that the chain of command is such that it's reported up to your risk management department or your financial controller, whoever is buying your insurance, so that they can make the decision on whether to report it to the insurance company. What you don't want to have is a situation where uh, you have uh, one of the examples that, that John went through, uh, you have repeated instances of mold in an apartment uh, and the, uh, the tenant is complaining about it. The tenant starts complaining about health problems. Uh, I think John mentioned it was a six-month six month issue of multiple leaks. Well, you could have a policy during that six-month period that ended. You know, if the tenant's first complaint was before the policy ends and you decide you're not going to ultimately remediate it until after, you could have a problem under a claims-made policy. So you have to make the decision within the organization whether it's worth reporting it to the insurance company. I hear a lot from companies that say, I don't want to report it because my premiums are going to go up. That largely is a fallacy when you report it correctly, which is if you're going to report, for instance, uh, a leak in a tenant's apartment that has some mold, you want to properly describe it as a very minor situation. In most instances, if there is no claim by the tenant at that point, you're just giving notice of circumstances that could give rise to a claim, you're never even going to hear from your insurance company about it. So again, you want to be careful with the reporting up and make sure that people know, uh, the decision makers for insurance know what claims are out there, what potential claims can be out there. Uh, again, the issue with uh, what's in the endorsement, there are varying definitions of, of uh, mold that can be included in the endorsement to give you coverage. Some are limited to mold, but some include legionnaires. Uh, and so you want to make sure you get the broadest coverage out there. These policies are written specifically written by insurance companies. There's not a trade organization that's writing these. So even though you may have, your, your broker might say, well, I got two quotes for a mold coverage endorsement. Both of them are $5,000. You need to talk to your broker about the scope of the coverage in there so, so you're comparing apples to apples. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, like you were talking about the fact that you said tell them it's minor in nature, but if you have like a $5,000 deductible, you're not even going to waste your time if it's minor in nature. Tell you're them. not. But that's the analysis that you should be going through. And that's what I'm trying to, to get across is that... Your, your organization might make the decision that for mold claims or bed bug claims, we're going to have a $5,000, $10,000, $50,000 deductible because we're going to handle the smaller claims in-house. When the smaller claims com comes in, you might then decide, do we report it to the insurance company or not? But that should be a conscious decision. It shouldn't just fall by the wayside because what might there are circumstances, and everybody has seen it, where you think a small claim where a small claim now can result in something larger. You have a big apartment complex, okay? Maybe you just recently bought the apartment complex. You find out that there's lead in one window. Well, what is the chance that there might be lead in all of the windows? You know, what might be a small circumstance right now could give rise to something broader. So my only point is make sure that it's a conscious decision in terms of giving notice, and part of that is the deductible amount. Uh, bed bug claims. Commercial general liability policies typically provide coverage for bodily injury and property damage. Uh, so your question initially when you get a claim in is was there bodily injury or property damage? Was there bodily injury? The pictures that we saw of bed bugs pretty much mean that there's, there's a bodily injury. Was there property damage? Uh, 
in terms of, of property damage, I'll give you a, a uh, example of a, a client called me there in North Jersey. They have an apartment complex it's right across from New York City. The apart I'm sorry, a commercial office right across from New York City. It is very, very, very expensive commercial office space, very upscale. Uh, there was a brokerage firm in that office, and uh, they got a call from the, uh, the facility manager for the brokerage firm, uh, livid, livid, that their office complex had bed bugs in it. And they were threatening to sue right out of the gate. They wanted uh, you know, an immediate abatement of rent. They had all these demands that they wanted. What the client found out after they went in and they looked around was that there, was bed, there were bed bugs in three specific locations within this office. It was in a lunchroom, it was in a meeting room, and it was in one highly paid executive's office. Now, that highly paid executive obviously used his office, obviously used the lunchroom, and obviously used the conference room. He also was on the road three or four days a week. Do you think the better argument is that the office complex was contaminated with bed bugs or that this executive brought the bed bugs into the, into the uh, office building? They're the types of things that you know, you're, you're going to want to look at in terms of bed bug claims, particularly whether, or whether it's a commercial setting or a residence to see where you can kind of limit liability. But going back to property damage, that instance the client was, uh, was able to avoid liability. But I have a lot of clients with commercial office space uh, and, and apartment buildings who have lost significant income because of bed bug claims. They've had to uh, close down sections of their office buildings. They've had to do all their remediation costs. They've had to reimburse rents. They've had to forego rent. If you have property damage from the bed bugs, you can typically collect under your business interruption coverage of your property policy for that interruption to your business. Again, it's a factor of how much is, it, how much is involved, what type of money is involved, and whether it's worth given your deductibles, uh, putting in a claim. But if you have a significant claim because your business is interrupted because of a bed bug situation, you should absolutely be seeking insurance coverage for it. Uh, did the policy holder have prior knowledge of the issue? Uh, mold, bed bugs, lead-based paint, how much of it was known by the organization? When did they know it? When did they try to fix it? When did they, did they avoid fixing it? Did a minor problem become a major problem because the policyholder didn't do something? They are all issues that uh, can come up in insurance context. Conversely, I have seen and I have made arguments that it is the insurance company who was responsible, for instance, for mold claims. Um, North Jersey, New York, Florida, Louisiana, I've handled claims that arise from storms and hurricanes. Uh, flood comes in. This happened particularly a lot in the Gulf Coast during the hurricanes down there. Uh, flood comes in, drywall is soaked because of the flood waters. Flood waters recede, temperature goes back up into the 90s. What do you think happens to those apartments where there was flood water? Uh, within days, they're covered with mold, within days. Uh, what we try to do and when I work with my, my policyholder clients is make sure that the insurance company is put on immediate notice of those claims and that if they tell you not to do anything until their adjuster gets out there, you specifically get that in writing and you warn them that they will be held liable for any delay that results because they can't get out there. We did this in one instance where the insurance company said we're swamped, we can't get an adjuster out there. The client called me, we drafted a letter, we said Understand that mold will continue to grow. That is a consequence of your inaction. And we're going to hold you responsible for that. You know what happened? They had an adjuster out there the next morning. So it's just something to be aware of in terms of, you know, when an insurance company calls you and says, I need to get somebody out there and don't do anything. Don't touch anything. Don't do anything. You know, make sure that it's properly documented and that you're protected if you think there's going to be a claim for some damage as a result of the delay. Yeah. Uh, as far as with bed bugs, you can apply that to the bed bugs as well. If you have a claim of a bed bug infestation, you can have an expert come out. They can tell you whether it's arborage, because of the number of bed bugs, whether there's the fecal matter, the caskins, or whether it's just a transfer point. And so therefore, you can really you know, minimize your 
you know, liability as far as whether you should know that the problem of you know that it's been existing for quite a while. And, and it also helps you kind of quantify what your damages are. You know, you get your arms around what actually is the extent of the damage here, uh, and that might also factor into whether you're letting your insur insurance company know of uh, the damages. Uh, the other thing with prior knowledge, and, you know, John, uh, the, both Johns talk about the Pinto example of punitive damages. Punitive damages are insurable in Maryland. Um, and I think they're insurable in Virginia, but I'm not sure. Meaning that if, you're, if you, you can get an insurance policy that will cover you for punitive damages. Uh, it's something to be aware of in Maryland. There are some states where you can't insure for punitive damages, but you can in Maryland. So if you have a punitive damage exclusion in your policy, it actually is a real exclusion and could hurt you in terms of getting coverage. Uh, bed bug policies, first claim property damage claims, you're going to want to look to the, uh, the nature of the, what you need to do to, get, to eradicate them, the amount of your damages. You're also going to look for certain types of exclusions. The uh, vermin exclusion is, has been used by some insurance companies to exclude bed bug claims. Uh, this is what I was talking about where I become a historian. Vermin exclusion started in the 1800s when Lloyd's of London was insuring uh, cargo vessels, ships that were sailing. And while those policies would literally insure for a pirate attack, uh, they would not insure for damage that resulted from vermin. What do they mean by that? Mice and rats. If, you know, the ship owner was not properly taking care of and maintaining their rats, uh, and it damaged the cargo, the insurance company would not provide coverage for that. And if you go back and look at what they have represented to uh, trade organizations, insurance departments throughout the country over the years, when they were talking about vermin, what they were talking about is a tenant does a lousy job in maintaining their apartment and cleaning their apartment, so you get a roach infestation. You, you, there's no insurance for that, because that's something that could have been prevented by kind of routine maintenance. Uh, but a tenant brings bed bugs into your commercial office building uh, and, and infests your office building, and there is nothing that you could have done to prevent that. That is not included under vermin as the insurance industry had originally defined it and explained it. So what do they do? Now they include bed bugs uh, in the policy. So some insurance policies out there have exclusions now for bed bugs. And by the way, they will sell you an endorsement to sell you coverage for bed bugs. What about pirate attacks? <laughs> you can still buy coverage for pirate attacks because there are pirate attacks off of Africa. And Lloyd's will still sell you a policy for a pirate attack. The problem you have with pirate attacks is that there are pirate attacks and then there are acts of war. So again, it's, you know, I, my, everybody in my office accuses me of broad and shallow knowledge about everything. That's part of, because uh, I had a European client ask me about to take a look at a policy uh, and it had a provision for pirate attacks. Um, bed bugs, loss of business interruption. Uh, one of the things you're gonna look at is, it, you know, you have a bed bug infestation that now not only is one apartment, but is multiple apartments. Now all of a sudden you have other tenants in the building saying to you, well, I wanna move out until you get this done. That's a business interruption claim. You've lost rent. You have to take a look at your policy to see whether it's worth putting in a claim. In terms of how far this can go, I'll give you an example. It's not a bed bug example, but I represented an apartment complex out in Arizona. They had a unit in one of their buildings. It was a uh, six building complex, had over, I think, 2,000 apartments in it. And one of their apartments blew up because there was a meth lab in the apartment. Now, this was a very nice apartment complex um, in suburban Arizona. And what happened was not only did they have damage to that property and they had you know, the surrounding buildings, but obviously you know, they had a, a building that was half a mile away. Well, one of the problems that they had is for a week or two, they had news crews every night out in front of their apartment complex talking about this meth lab. Well, what do you think that does to pr prospective tenants? 
And what do you think that does to current tenants? I don't want to live in a drug-infested apartment complex. So what they saw was their vacancy rate went from about 92%, if I recall, down to about 65% within two years. Uh, we successfully put in an insurance claim for that because we argued that the only thing that happened was that explosion and we had enough evidence and you know the client did a good job and I'll talk about this in a minute in documenting to say to connect the loss of tenants to the explosion and the bad press that resulted from it. Yeah. What about a situation where the tenant says I want to move out until you get the bed bug situation solved that tenant, let's say, moves into a Motel 8 and takes the bed, some of the bed bugs with them to the Motel 8. And, all sudden, and you end up getting sued by Motel mo Yeah. If, if you were to get sued by mo Motel 8 for your negligence in moving that tenant to the motel, you would be covered by your general liability policy because the, they would allege property damage as a result of your negligence. I assume that that's what they would allege, but typically there would be coverage for that. Yeah? Uh, is, is it there possible for tenants, uh, tenants covers, just tenants is uh, insured by themselves. Is it possible and not a day insurance industry cover for the tenants policy include the damage from bad buying? Uh, most likely, no. Uh, I was going to talk about the policies that you're getting from your tenants when they have apartment complex, uh, when they're apartment tenant, com tenant policies. Uh, tenant policies are very limited. Uh, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't. So it, the tenant comes to you and says, I have bed bugs. Uh, and in the, conver in the part of the conversation that we were talking about where you're doing the interview, the tenant says, I just got back from a trip uh, uh, two days ago, and now I realize that there are bed bugs in the apartment. And you talk to the tenant, and the tenant says, uh, no, I never noticed them before that. Well, where were you? Where did you stay? And you narrow it down to where the tenant, and you have pretty clear evidence that the tenant brought the bed bugs into the apartment. Uh, and take a worst case scenario, that now the bed bugs have spread to multiple apartments, so you have a lot of costs. I would absolutely tell that client to put their insurance company on notice. Uh, and you may have a claim against them. The other thing you want to do is, uh, I don't know how many people here deal with certificates of insurance or naming other parties as additional insureds. Uh, if, if there is any contractor that you're using that is responsible for assisting you in any of this, whether it's uh, bed bug remediation, mold remediation, bed bug testing, mold testing, lead, ba lead based, based, pe based paint testing. Uh, if you are relying upon them, you should absolutely be listed on their policy as an additional insured, and you should absolutely make sure you have proof of their coverage. Uh, there's a lot of good treaties out there and books, and your brokers can help explain to you what you really need to do to make sure that there's uh, when you ask somebody to be an additional insured, you're actually getting something from it. But to the extent that you're relying upon somebody, you should absolutely require that they are uh, an additional insured. Um, just in case there's any questions, I'm going to try to wrap up here with, uh, with some of my tips in terms of getting insurance coverage paid. Uh, the insurance coverage is absolutely an example of the squeaky wheel gets results. You want to be a pain in their ass. You want to document everything. You want to be corresponding with them. You know, what I do in working with a client is claim comes in. You get a call from an a adjuster. They say, we need these 20 categories of documents. So you start gathering the documents. When you send the documents to the insurance company, you should be sending a transmittal. You asked for these documents. I have attached each of those documents. Please advise if you need any more documents so that you are boxing them in in terms of what documents they've asked for. They come back to you a week later and they say, we need these documents. Again, you document it. Uh, they come back and they say, I should be able to make my coverage determination in the next 30 days. You should absolutely send them an email saying, just to confirm our conversation today, you said you would get back to me within 30 days with the result of your investigation. Every single thing should be documented, and there's two reasons for that. One is, every claims person has their claim files reviewed by their supervisor. 
and they get embarrassed by this type of stuff. So being the squeaky wheel really does motivate the claims, ha claims handler to get rid of you. It's particularly important if you are in a situation where uh, there are multiple claims being presented at the same time, such as what's happening in North Jersey and New York, making sure that your file's at the top of the stack. The second thing is that if you have an insurance company that is not acting properly, and you know, that's what I see is most instances where the insurance company is not acting properly, you have helped me make my case because you have documented everything. You've documented every communication with them. You've documented every stonewalling attempt by them. Um, I had a case against Fireman's Fund where uh, Fireman's Fund decided that what they were going to do was to pay bonuses throughout the company based on loss reserves. I'm not going to bore you with what that is, but basically it's a function of, of claim, uh, policy premium that comes in versus policy dollars that go out in terms of paying claims. Well, they were sharing this bonus pool with their claims handlers. Well, what can a claims person do to reduce claims payments by the insurance company? Not pay claims or delay paying claims. And what we found was a practice of uh, Fireman's Fund routinely changing claims people. So you would send all this information. You'd get, I think I have everything. I should be able to get back to you in the next 30 days with the decision. 28 days later, literally 28 days later, you would get a letter saying, I've recently been assigned your case, and please tell me about this claim. Uh, for this policy holder, it happened four times, four separate claims people within a year uh, on a property damage claim. So it helps me in terms of winning your case for you if you want to then sue for bad faith under the policy by having everything documented. Uh, it's kind of like progressive discipline. Uh, in employment situations, you know, you hope it corrects their behavior by sending the letters to them, but if it doesn't, you have enough to go after them when you have to go to court. Uh, second thing in, in terms of getting a claim paid is, you know, make sure all of your, your assets are marshaled. You know, you want to make sure that anything, any weight you can bring to bear on the insurance company is brought. So by that I mean, if you have a claim and you're coming up upon renewal, renewal time, talk to your broker about talking to the insurance company and getting it paid. If you have a significant uh, premium, if you're part of a big organization, you know, renewal time is the time to start discussing that type of stuff. Uh, you know, I've said to clients, and I was in-house for a long time, and I've had these negotiations with insurance companies where I've said, why would we possibly want to renew with you? Why? You don't pay your claims. That's the type of conversation to have at renewal time period uh, in terms of getting a claim paid. John? Two minutes. Uh, well, on that note, I'm done. Uh, does anyone, anyone have any questions? Any, either for either of the, the Johns as well? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, we have a lot of material here for you. And obviously, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to either give any of us a call or shoot us an email. Thanks a lot.